five years now since notorious Australian terrorist Khaled Sharouf and his wife Tara Nettleton took their children to Syria and parts of Iraq to join Islamic State. Now, in that time, it's very difficult to know just what difficulties these children went through. Tara Nettleton, their mother, died of illness about a year after they went there. Khaled Sharouf is thought to have been killed in an airstrike in about 2017 with at least two of his young boys. For the remaining children, well, as I say, what have they gone through during that time? One of the girls, Zainab, uh, Zainab was married off, not once but twice, to friends of her father. She's had two children of her own while over there and is now heavily pregnant with a third, and she's still only 18 years old. Her sister, 17-year-old Hoda, and her 8-year-old brother, Hamza, have also survived the past five years there, but they are now set to return to Australia. Now, this has been a difficult operation at many levels. But the crucial point here is the Australian government took the view these children are Australian citizens who aren't responsible for the crimes of their parents and should be brought home. An earlier attempt to do just that failed, but late yesterday they were taken from a refugee camp in Syria across the border to Iraq to begin their journey home. So too were three young children of another Australian terrorist, Yasin Rizvik. We have kept a very uh, low-key approach to how we've been addressing this issue. That has been in the interests of the safety uh, of those involved and, uh, and those who are, who are assisting us in this task. Um, the opportunity now is for these young children who are coming back to Australia. They can't be held responsible for the crimes of their parents. I mean, the fact that you would take a child and put them in a conflict zone like this is despicable. And I find it disgusting. But the children um, can't be held responsible for that. And where we have carefully considered their cases, um, then we have taken action to safely repatriate them and we'll consider any other such cases. Now, the Prime Minister is well aware not all Australians will be comfortable with the idea of these kids living perhaps in their neighbourhood, going to the same school as their own kids. Who knows what sort of indoctrination or brainwashing they've been through while over there. But there's also been enormous sympathy for the plight these children faced, particularly after the extraordinary efforts of Karen Nettleton, the grandmother of the Sharouf children. There's also the question of international obligations here. There's been growing pressure on Western countries since the collapse of Islamic State to deal with their own citizens who became foreign fighters, rather than just leaving them to rot in refugee camps or, worse, letting them escape, perhaps, into third countries. And then there's also been the growing pressure to do something about the children left behind by so many foreign fighters who died, as we've seen in the case of the Sharouf children. Here's what the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has said in a recent report. All children under the age of 18, including children whose parents are foreign fighters and children who are recruited themselves, benefit from the rights offered to them under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The recruitment of children is a violation of international human rights law, and the mere fact of having travelled to join a terrorist group cannot by itself be considered as being criminal on the part of the child. The emphasis when dealing with child returnees should therefore be on rehabilitation and reintegration, although, it notes, prosecution may remain an option in appropriate cases. So what is known about the experience these children have been through and what now can we expect in terms of their return to Australia? Greg Barton from Deakin University is a terrorism expert, joins me now this afternoon. Thanks very much for your time this afternoon. So, look... Is there much research about children in this situation, children taken to Syria and Iraq by parents who signed up as foreign fighters? The uh, so-called Islamic State Caliphate, David, is a fairly new thing. So we haven't had much research on this. We haven't had many... We expected a flood of returnees. It hasn't really happened yet. Uh, hundreds have gone back to Southeast Asia, but, you know, we're just at the beginning of this process. Back when al-Qaeda had lots of foreign fighters, only perhaps 4,000, though, against 42,000 for Islamic State, in the 1980s, early 90s, it wasn't women and children by and large. Right. So this is a new thing. This is a new thing because they were trying to establish a state. Yeah. They wanted families to live there. We have had a lot of experience, though, with insurgencies often involving terrorist groups in civil war context. Think of Sri Lanka, think of the FARC in Colombia, think of the current situation in Mindanao and the Philippines, where post-conflict rehabilitation is, is understood, if not always affected very well. So it's not... And what does that tell us, uh, particularly about... Kids who, I mean, are they actively um, indoctrinated? Would they have gone to some form of schooling at all? What situation would they have been in? Uh, 
a hellish situation. It's, it's beyond imagining. They, they weren't properly educated. Uh, we've got kids in these camps in, in Syria, in some cases, who are illiterate. Sometimes they don't know their parents. Their health is in a terrible state. They've experienced all sorts of trauma. What we do know in general about kids in this situation is that, A, if, if you don't try and, and rehabilitate them, and, and this whole process of radicalisation is a social process, so bringing them back into a healthy social context is really key, then you're likely to have them radicalise themselves, if not already, and you have a next generation. So, and that's the danger of leaving them in a camp like they've been in with thousands and thousands of yeah. others. Yeah, and we've kitted ourselves in Australia that, you know, our national um, uh, security, you know, is benefiting from them being offshore. But in, the, in a digital age of social media, uh, if a kid is recruited as, a, as an older teenager, released perhaps by the SDF because of lack of resources, perhaps ends up in Turkey or Iraq mm -hmm. and is online being used by handlers themselves that radicalised, reaching out to Australian homes... That's a problem for us. We're, we're better off dealing with them here where we can control what happens. Well, do you think Australian security agencies would have much of an idea of, of the experience these children have had over the last five years? How much information would they have? It's, it varies greatly according to the kids. We don't even know the exact number. We know there's at least 50 women and children left in these uh, Syrian Democratic Force camps in northeastern Syria. We don't know the exact number. Um, there's a lot we don't know, the unknown unknowns. Uh, You're talking about 50 Australian? Yes, that's right. Women uh, and kids? Yeah, kids. and... and, and thousands of foreign mm. uh, kids of for foreign terrorist fighters uh, and, and, and many thousands more of local Syrian and Iraqi fighters. So, And already we've had a release of 800 of women and children because the SDF are limited in the resources. These camps are at least two or three times... Well, this is the thing. They're, they're, exactly, and they're trying to put pressure, as others are, on Western countries to do more about those women and children in particular. And just this month we've seen um, the, the United States uh, take about six of their children... The French have taken 12, the Dutch two, and now Australia's taking this group of uh, eight kids. So we're not alone in this. How much international pressure has been brought to bear on Western countries here? It's been a lot of moral pressure and also some, some practical reasoning. The SDF control that uh, northeastern third of Syria, north of the Euphrates River, but only a part of that is their natural territory. The uh, Turks threatened to come across the border and fight the SDF, claiming that the, the Kurdish fighters are linked to Kurdish fighters in, in Turkey. Uh, they're forced to negotiate, negotiate with the Assad regime in Damascus, which you can hardly be a palatable option. So it's not even clear how long they can control the territory where these camps are. Their resources are limited, so they're forced to steadily release people. So when they say, take them home, it's not just an empty uh, plea or an empty threat. I mean, the reality is the clock's ticking. Is there the potential that these children have at all committed crimes themselves under Australia's anti-terror laws? I think with older teenagers, that's certainly possible. Um, Islamic State was targeting uh, teenagers, um, you know, below the normal uh, cohort of, of, of people in their 20s, mm. uh, and that's a possibility. But, but even so, the question in terms of our uh, national interest, national security, is are we better letting them go into the wild where they'll be online and, 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 and seeking to recruit, or are we better dealing with them back here where we have some controls. Well, and that's yeah. the broader debate we've mm. had for some time about the, the adults, mm. the foreign fighters. Um, you know, many have argued uh, you know, they should be tried over there uh, in either Iraq or Syria. That's started to happen to a degree, but has it been successful? No, the overseas trials, the trials in Iraq have been absolutely lacking in any standard um, uh, you know, procedures. We've had kids, I mean, teenagers up before a judge for several minutes and then sent off to be hung. Uh, we've had more senior fighters who have paid their way out and are back in the wild in Iraq. So the area around... They've bribed their way out. Yeah, the area around Mosul, Nineveh province, um, is, is a wild west where the Islamic State insurgency controls the night and they've got a lot of money and a lot of resources. They know where people live. They've got leverage. Uh, they, they still terrorise the population. And it's their the senior guys... The around exactly where yeah. the Sharif kids are now. Yes, well, we understand that they're in northeastern Iraq, uh, in, in the sort of Kurdish, so called Kurdistan region of northeastern Iraq, handed over by the Syrian Kurds. We've got an embassy in Baghdad. Obviously, we can, we can now engage in Iraqi territory, western yeah. Syria. That was very hard. I mean, some countries, Sweden, I know, has said there should be an international tribunal set up in the region to deal with all, this, um, all these trials, given the problems. But that'd be a very lengthy process, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, we're sort of caught between what would be ideal and what's, what's realistic and possible. I think the way the justice is working on the Iraqi side, unfortunately, suggests we're going to actually repeat the cycle of violence because we'll have a traumatised Sunni population in the north who have experienced great injustice, often quite arbitrary, 
and uh, those who survive will, you know, be fodder for, for recruitment if, if they aren't already radicalised. And of course, we're talking about the children here primarily today, but when it comes to the adult foreign fighters, their return does pose clearly uh, a level of risk, and indeed we've seen some return foreign fighters in other countries engaged in uh, terrorist atrocities. Yes, famously the November 13 attack 2015 in Paris involved links with people returning. One thing to understand, though, is Australia is in a remarkably good position vis-à-vis -vis legislation. In October 2014, we changed the Foreign Incursions Act to say that if you're in a prescribed area, Nineveh, uh, province, uh, Mosul City, or um, Raqqa, or Deir Azur governance in Syria, then you had to give evidence that you went with Islamic State because Islamic State controlled those areas. Uh, that makes it much easier for us to go ahead with successful prosecutions. Mm -hmm. Most Western nations don't have that legislative fallback. So we are actually in a position where we can do something and you know, if the same argument as the kids, if they're back here and we prosecute, we detain, we manage them, it's a hassle, it's an expense, but it's much better than, than being in the wild back in the jihadi ecosystem online trying to recruit. Greg Barton from Deakin University, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, David. Appreciate